tiger on the prowl. I'ma make you go wild. I'm original, and I told you so. I'm a kid in the candy store. Put the leather on the denim. I ain't the cure, I'm the venom. If you wanna find me, find the tail light. Something's coming in, you're gonna wanna take a red eye. It's time to go. It's time to go. Get ready. Friends, welcome to Umpire at Home. Keely Dunn, FH Umpires, and you are the best third team in the world. I am so excited to see you guys today. Oh my God. I don't know. I'm just, I'm in a really great mood. I think part of it has to do with the great new music. Actually, I did play this when Dan Barstow was on, uh, but I think I was just too nervous about that show to really get into it. But man, I love this song. I'm just playing the instrumental version a little bit. Oh, it's so dope. So good. Anyway, hi. It is Wednesday. It is an umpired home, and I'm I'm also really excited to have my special guest on today. This is really interesting. Uh, I've never done anything like this before, and neither has Corey. Corey is my partner, and he is a personal trainer. I will be introducing you to him in a few minutes, but he's going to help me with this topic and help us all learn about it because he's really good at this stuff. And we talk about it all the time. We talk about training all the time. We talk about methods and new things. And you'll see why in a few minutes when he comes on. So I hope you're all going to give him a really warm welcome when he pops in, because that'll be great. I would love to say hi to you all like I always do. Jammin, yes. Coach Meg Dudick. Neil's always first. Good to see you, sir. Rachel is here and Cap. Sorry, <laughs> Cabernet Sauvignon today. Nice to know. Um, evening third team, hello Keely. Oh my gosh, Corey, can you see that? Corey's in the green room, but I'm wondering if you can see the comment on the screen in Swedish. And he's nodding his head and I think he understands it. So he's been getting in touch with his relatives in Sweden um, over Facebook over the last, you know, couple years and occasionally he'll say oh I think I understand what they're saying <laughs> but not too much it's international tea day says Simon sir oh wait let me turn it to the proper side I have my fresh tea as always Michael Vince is here hey friend good to see you I'm looking forward to chatting with you next Monday Michael is part of the third team yellow and he has signed up for the huddle so you have to be there now. <laughs> you can't let down because I've just told everybody live that you're going to be there. Let me know how my sound levels are. Um, my mic is a little, uh, it's a little wonky today. It's the arm and the, anyway, there you go. Andy's here. Yay. Good to see you. Simon's laughing. 
I have a lot of new mods today. I know I learned how to do that. I learned how to do mods. So, I mean, you guys are a super well-behaved bunch, but you never know. Stardom may be just around the corner, knocking on the door of being a viral sensation. I'll talk about why in just a second. And what if I need some help? And there's a lot to handle here. And Andy in particular is going to be helping me on future broadcasts as we learn the software together. So very exciting. Alex is here. Hey, from Lancaster, as always, good to see you. I hope you like the new music, Rachel. I do. It's got a great groove. Always hard at work. Always, always, always. Um, let's see. No, <laughs> no, sorry. No, it's bad enough that Corey has to hear me. So every day when I, before I come on a live stream, when I put my makeup on, I put my headphones in and I do it on that, um, I do it on noise control so I can't even hear myself. And then I just sing. And Corey will come in and he'll sort of poke his head around the corner. He'll be like, mm. I used to be able to sing, but I sure can't anymore. It's something you have to practice. Dennis is here. Yes. Oh, great to see you. Uh, Gopi's here. Hi. Great to have you as always from India. Scott Riley's here. Don't know what you've done to you, but you have a... What? You've got a bottle of booze with you. Look, you can have fun without alcohol, okay? I'm not making these choices for you, but if you decide to have a drink, I understand. And I just wish I could join you. And happy Wednesday from Andrea... Simon Begg is here. Awesome. Hello, hello. Sound is good. Thank you so much, Rachel and Simon, for letting me know. If you're new, if you've never watched an Umpire at Home, uh, an FH Umpire's live stream before, say something in the comments so that we can all say hi and welcome you because this is a really beautifully welcoming family. And uh, I would like you to share in that experience. So make sure you say you're new. Great to have you. We're going to bring Corey on in just a couple seconds uh, after I do some announcements, announcements, announcements. I need, a, I need a sound effect to help me with that one. I need somebody else saying announcements. That's from my childhood, and I have no idea where it came from. I have no idea at all. Anyway, I would like to say a couple thank yous to a few people. Uh, where is it? No, it's not that one. It's this one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> of course, my, my things are overlapping. But uh, I want to say big thank you to Mario Del Mello. He Mario is a um, Canadian. He's out in Nova Scotia. Oh, God, if I'm wrong, Mario, I'm so sorry. And uh, he said that he really enjoys the videos and all the situations. He's also on the board of Field Hockey Canada. So <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you for liking me. <laughs> Thank you for not being mad at me right now like everybody else is. Yeah. And um, I also want to say a big thank you to James right there. Had, had his first game back after several years out, felt a ton more confident thanks to the What Up Wednesday sessions and the posts. Oh, I'm getting verklept. I love, I love, love, love hearing that feedback. If you would like to support, um, oh, I don't have the graphic on here, but just go to, um, I'll find the graphic anyway, but you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Keely Dunn. Pretty easy. And if you want to level up that relationship, you could do something really funky, like join the green membership. It's just $3 a month US. That's all it is, but you can help support us and keep things going. For $17 a month, you can get the entire yellow mentorship experience. Now, just ask around. There's a few yellow people here that are on board, and they can tell you all about the fun that we have in the huddles and on the weekend watch parties and all that kind of thing. I think I'm going to start drinking rosé for the weekend watch parties. Just a side of that right now. There you go. Um... I actually want to meet this music now, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. There it is. Okay, what else do I need to say? Have you seen my short? <laughs> you guys, this is the closest I've ever been to going viral. Now, uh, this I can blame 
completely on my friend. Oh, there's two of me on the screen. Oh, whatever. How does that? <laughs> oh, I don't know how to remove this right now. Yeah, I don't want to do anything with that. There's two of me, whatever. So uh, my good friend Bernardo of the Self Passes put this up on the internets, I think two days ago now. And of course, Self Pass is one of the biggest social media platforms out there. And just simply asked, as many people do, is this yellow or red? Well, guess what? Uh, there were tons, I think there's about 160 comments on, on their post. And then I decided that it required an answer. Here's the thing. I, I really appreciate that these platforms bring attention to rules questions and interpretation questions, but how about that answer? So in the future, all of you, tag me so that I can help you out with an answer. Like, sure, we'll wait. We'll wait like 24 hours and see what everybody else says. Get the conversation going. Get the engagement. I'm not here to bust on your engagement. I get it. But let's get the information into their hands. So I did make a video and let's see if that will happen. Yes, fhempires.com handball. That'll take you to the YouTube short. It's 58 seconds. My friend Matt Harrison was like, well, I haven't watched the video yet, but I say this. And I'm like, Matt, it's 58 seconds. Just click on the damn link. Matt Harrison. If you're on, you're in trouble, sir. So anyway, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, go have a look. If you have had a look at it and you didn't like it on YouTube, would you please go and give it one of these? I would really, really appreciate it. It's had something like 1,200 views so far, which is amazing with 16 likes. Come on, come on, wait. Just give it a little love. That would be great. I'd appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see, what else? Am I gonna, am I gonna click on this? Oh, I'm so bold. I'm clicking on things in the background and don't know if I'm gonna break things. Uh, the other thing I wanna talk about is that I am gonna run the next mission critical positioning session intensive coming up Thursday, May 13th. And <laughs> this is where you can go to sign up. A whole bunch of people have been asking me about this and here's a date. So just go there. It's going to be at the usual this time um, because that seems to work for a lot of European and such folks. If you're in a different time zone and this is terrible for you, please just send me a note. And I will find a way to stage something else, okay? Um, I need to know that there's a demand for it in other time zones. And then I'll be there. If I have to get up at three in the morning and teach, I am happy to do that. I've done it before. I shall do it again. It might kill me, but I'll be there. So there you go. Okay, what's the last? Oh, Andy, you king. Look at that. Oh, no, it's Keely Dunn. It's my full name. Or no, is it just Keely? Mm, I don't know. Yellow rocks. Thank you, Simon. And the subscribe button. Heck yes. Please do that. Niels, did I make you a mod too? I think I did. If I hadn't, I'll do that. What about Corey? Well, we will talk about him and all the ways that he provides stuff in a moment. Hey, Kat, you're here. Good to see you. And only 10 likes. Oh my God, you guys are so great. <laughs> Yay, mods. I should have done this years ago. What was I thinking? Okay, um, that is all of my announcements. So let's get on to the main feature. Corey, are you ready? Going to bring him on in just a sec. But I do want you to meet Corey Samuelson. He heads up Stoic Strength, which is the business through which he provides um coaching services to clients, not just here in Calgary. He, he does personal training for individual clients here in Calgary, but he also does remote coaching for people anywhere. And uh, he, from the name Stoic Strength, you would guess that he has an orientation in Stoicism. So we have a lot of conversations in the apartment about Stoic philosophy and how it applies to the way that we live our lives now. So I'm going to let him, you know, talk.
talk about things like that as we go. Let me make sure that I've got him assigned properly as a guest. And I think I think we're ready. So everybody, big warm welcome, please, for Corey Samuelson. Hello. <laughs> How are you, sweetie? <laughs> Oh, you're a little, you're, uh, let's see. You might still be muted. Interview, I see you there. Can you talk again? Mm, let me know everybody at home. I don't think that there is sound. Guest didn't, isn't good anymore. Assign. I've assigned you, so I don't know what's happening. Corey, can you do me a favor? And I'm going to kick you out. Can you rejoin through the link? Okay, this is, this is something that occasionally happens, so we'll fix this, but I'm going to kick you out and then just come on back in a second. Sorry, everybody. Hey, no sound. Okay, so I was correct. Okay, so Corey's going to sign back in. I mean, it's hilarious. He's literally right there. He is right there. And we tested this. Okay. A sign. I don't know why this isn't working. How about now? It's working now. Hi, Corey. Hey. <laughs> oh, my God. Sorry about that. There's nothing like a technical problem to make it a true Keely Dunn live stream. As we all yeah, know. Yeah, no worries. As we all know. So welcome from the next door room. This is not awkward at all. Yeah. I just absolutely Yeah, the nervous. weather here is quite nice. I don't know how it oh, is yeah? in the living room. Oh, yeah. It's uh it's it's a little <laughs> warm, I have to say. I'm I'm not really yeah. looking to drink too much of my tea because I'm like sweating probably because I always just get over anxious for these things. But uh thanks for thanks for jumping on and I'm excited about you being able to share all the stuff that you know and all the stuff that you share with me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> every day, <laughs> which is awesome, about uh, training and stoicism, and specifically as we get onto today's topic, backwards running. So how about you tell the folks at home who have no idea um, wh who you are and what you do, tell them about yourself. All right. So Keely went into it a little bit. Um, stoicism is a big part of my philosophy of training even, in that we can only choose to do things. We can, we can have intentions. And as far as the body is concerned, we might intend to be healthy. We may use exercise, eating right, uh, getting enough sleep, recovery, getting outside, getting good fresh air, that kind of thing. But what the body is gonna do with all that, with all that uh, environmental change and uh, you know the stimulus that we introduce for ourselves, what, it, what the body does with it, that isn't up to us and we can do our very best. Um, and this is relevant for athletes and for people who are physically active, for umpires in that sometimes we try to force the body to be healthy and to be fit. And what I mean by that is that we sometimes will try to work through pain or to you know have these little injuries and such, and just think, well, I'm just gonna keep going. Sometimes that can work, but sometimes that doesn't work that well. And we'll talk a little bit about how that relates to backward running and whatnot. Okay. Um, but as far as my, oh, did you have something to say there? Oh, I was just gonna say, I was gonna invite <laughs> you to talk about your background a little bit and how you got right. into personal training and, I, I want you to talk uh, a little bit about why you're so interested in issues around sort of health and longevity. And, you know, because because I, I know, I, I mean, you are a very physically fit individual, but you're not about having the six pack abs and the, the big biceps. You just happen to have those. Um, but your focus is on how your training is is going to help you in your life and with making that a long and happy life. So, so talk about how you got into training and what's inspired you to get to where you are now. All right. 
I will I'll try not to run on too much. Uh, Keely knows me pretty well. And when I tell stories or when I have <laughs> things to share, I get a little bit uh, verbose and take these tangents that how is, does this relate to anything really? <laughs> we so I'm going to try to be as succinct as I, <laughs> I'll try to be succinct here. Um, I'm uh, one of four children and my older brother, who's 12 years older than I am, he got into powerlifting um, when I was, I don't know, I was probably eight years old, nine years old when he started working out in the gym. And because I idolized him, I wanted to do what he was doing. So he introduced me to weightlifting, which was his thing. And I, I wanted to be like him. So he played soccer. I played soccer. He skied in the, well, cross-country skied in the winter. So I did that as well. I basically just tried to be him. And I really liked being physically active. It, I had a lot of success with it, meaning not that I was athletically winning trophies or anything like that, but I was reaping the benefits. I felt really good. And I was, I was like, even in elementary school, running at the, you know, not at number one all the time, but I was, I was known as the athletic kid mm -hmm. kind of thing. And that continued. Yeah. Um, and you got, you got into martial arts at some point as well. So, um, yeah, that, that was later. That was after, uh, okay. I did compete in gymnastics. I started at 13, right. went for about four years, uh, provincial level stuff. So no real crazy stunts. Um, then I was playing soccer when I was, had graduated Okay. and that continued for four or five years as well. Yep. And, and then yeah, I got into the martial arts because I'd been in a long-term relationship and that ended and mm -hmm. I was, had free time. So I thought, well, what am I going to do now? And I, so I got into martial arts and I did that for four years. I was an apprenticing instructor. I, I just dove headfirst into it. I was training three, four or five hours a day, sometimes four five, six days a week. And I got burnt out doing that, mm -hmm. but it was really, it, it, it tied into the gymnastics because of the body awareness and everything. So I, right. I really enjoyed that. Right. Um, then there was, and I had continued working out the whole time. Like there was only one stint, actually twice, I think. Once when I moved from BC to Alberta mm -hmm. where I didn't work out. And then I had a, an athletic hernia that took me out of commission. Yes. And so those were the two times that I really haven't been working out. Right. Um, where was I getting to? Ah, yes. So at one point, after having lived in Alberta for a while, I moved back to, to BC. And I lived with my brother and his family just because I was thinking about life. And he said, hey, why don't you just come out here? They had a cabin by a lake. And they said, yeah, you can stay out there every once in a while. So I thought, this is great. And I started playing soccer with him because he had continued to do that even to, into his adulthood. And this was one of the most pivotal moments in my life in that, like I say, I, I had this continuous, consistent relationship with fitness. Right. I worked out pretty much daily. And I was, I was fit in certain parameters, but I was not fit. It had been about 15 to 20 years between that last soccer match in BC and the one that I wanted to take part in again as an adult now. And I played the first game and yeah, I was, I was sore and it was, it was tough. And then I played the second game and circumstances were a little bit colder. It was windy. It was raining, yeah. not quite snowing, but it was, it was early in the season and a guy had the ball and he broke by me and I, and I thought, well, that's not happening. So I quickly turned around and just sprinted as hard as I could felt something in my Achilles area and realized, okay, that's not good, but I, I hadn't caught the guy yet. So I just kept going, which was idiotic. Yep. And what ended up happening was I had a, an Achilles tendonitis issue. Right. And so that was the end of the season. I think I caught like one more game and we didn't do that well. So that was it. So it was a real light bulb moment as far as fitness and conditioning mm -hmm. in my education as a trainer. Now I wasn't certified at this point. Right. That that happened after I moved back to Alberta again, and I moved back to Alberta for that reason to be a trainer because I, I just couldn't make it happen 
in the little town of Prince George in BC. Right. It just wasn't working out. I couldn't get the the scheduling of the classes. People weren't interested in it, so they kept canceling it. And yeah. thought, well, this is silly. So then I became a trainer, and that getting injured really was a part of that decision because I realized I really don't know that much about training. I, I knew a lot, but I didn't know as much as I needed to. And that was a real wake up call. Okay. So, so you got How's into that? training. Yeah, good. Because you, so what I'm <clears throat> taking from this is that you got into training because you realized that even though you were working out really steadily, um, you weren't doing what you needed to do in order to prepare you for the activities that you really were interested in partaking in. So, so this is this is an interesting little lesson that I I want to sort of bring in for um, for everybody watching who are umpires who now I know that we all okay not me the, some of you really enjoy going for long runs and you know doing other things and that's fine but you have to also recognize that potentially this isn't the best preparation that you could be doing in order to get you ready for umpiring. So what Corey and I are going to talk about today is a form of training that we're learning about right now that will, I think, much more directly help you with your umpiring fitness specifically. Also help you if you're a player as well. I think it's still, you know, very relevant. Um, as a player, but, um, for me, you know, and, and let's, let's start talking about why we're getting into this backwards running thing, because like, let's face it, it's, this stuff is like, it's a little weird, right? Like it's, it's, it's kind of weird, but, um, for, for my part, and again, like Corey knows all this cause he was around for a good chunk of it. But, uh, for those of you who don't know that much about me and my, my history, it's actually been two years ago now that I got a knee replacement. So this is my, this is my Instagram feed. And this is the kind of crazy stuff that I do on, um, Instagram. Wait, I got to pull up the right window so I can pop up this, this Instagram post. So this was the post in which I, um, announced to the world that I was expecting a new knee. Um, I was very excited, uh, obviously because I had actually, um, Corey actually took all these pictures by the way. Um, I had been diagnosed with osteoarthritis when I was in my 20s, which is very, very, very early and not when you would expect um, a, a person who was obviously very, very active. I was playing, uh, I started playing high performance field hockey when I was uh, 16. I was playing for the dinos and I was told basically that I had to stop. I was told that, nope, your, your knees are not in good shape and you need to stop playing and umpiring. And I said, nope. So um, <laughs> I went through two knee replacements and it's actually, so April 16th is Neil's, was Neil's second birthday. So this one is Neil. That was my left knee. And then I had Jenny uh, October 1st, so five months later. So, um, if you want to see the ridiculous things that I did with, uh, my knee replacements, then go to Instagram, go to my Instagram and, and see how silly that was. But, um, one of the things that I was prescribed by, uh, not my initial set of, not my initial surgeon or my initial set of rehab, but when I went to a specialist knee clinic starting about six months ago now, because I was still struggling. I'm still struggling with pain and mobility and things like that. And the doctor said, you really should be doing a lot of backwards walking and particularly up hills. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm not proud. I'm ready to do anything that's going to help me. But we were in COVID, we were in a shutdown. Nobody could use a treadmill uh, inside unless I had bought my own. And the thing about winter in Calgary is that walking outside is treacherous at the best of times when you have, uh, two metal knees and not the best, uh, dexterity and balance and things like that, or confidence, just not a good time to do it. So I'd been mulling this over and mulling this over. And then Corey, you said the other day, uh, it was what, maybe three weeks ago. You're like, Hey, I found something really weird about backwards running on the internet. So 
what was it that you found and why did we start talking about it in the context of my rehabilitation? Well, I stumbled across a website, a YouTube channel, and it's called Knees Over Toes Guy. And he had, he had come across my radar months before. And I really didn't think too much about it at the time. Mm -hmm. And then for, for whatever reason, there was an, I, I think he was referred to by another trainer because I'm always online looking at, at training information and, and exercises and whatnot. Yeah. just for interest. And they had mentioned that they were working one of the exercises that he was using. So I clicked through to his website and I thought, well, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. And he was doing a, a backward sled pull. Okay. And as he was showing that exercise to the person he was working with, he was also talking about other things and how to scale that back and whatnot. And he was talking about how good for the knees backward walking was so mm -hmm. I thought oh actually this this is something we should do not only for you but I was interested for myself because right. of what he was saying about the the health of the knees and the how progressing that to running and then doing that resistance work with the, the sled pull okay which you could do outside uh, in a field now that the, the snow is starting to pretty much be gone permanently <laughs> Pretty much, so, I think that was. Yeah. We had, a, we had a, everybody. We had a, we had our last snowfall. Was it yesterday that it snowed, or was it Monday? I can't remember. Like Sunday, was there Monday. was a big dump, and then yeah, there was more snow on Monday, and I, it's now sixteen degrees outside. So you know, welcome to Calgary weather. But there you go. So before we get into like different exercises or even the benefits, let's talk about exactly what backwards running is because. There's a few different terms that are floating around. Can you sort of just set out for us the difference between like the different terms? Because I've heard backwards running, I've heard retro running, I've heard backpedaling. What are those things and how are they different? They generally mean the same thing. Um, okay. Just, li just like the difference between, say, sprinting and running, right? It, it's probably just a matter of velocity. Mm -hmm. So there, there is one category that I thought I would bring up that that sometimes people think oh it's back pedaling but that's actually a fairly specific movement pattern okay. and that's like uh, in American football um, where they're actually what is it called uh, the defensive back will generally be crouched over and be prepared to to block a runner from breaking through and that kind of thing so right. so okay. backpedaling is not what we're talking about so otherwise backward walking you're walking backward running you're running if you're doing it at maximum velocity then we might call it backward sprinting okay but all of those basically mean the same thing retro running as well i think you mentioned Yes. Okay. Because backpedaling is something that um, maybe we might do a form of that when we're playing in that we might be low and crouched because we're, um, we're tracking an, an attacker or a ball carrier is coming at us and we might be backpedaling a bit because we're going to be jab tackling or do, doing something like that. And that just br brings up a little point that I wanted everybody at home to understand as well is, is that, um, you know, what, what do you know about hockey and hockey umpiring in particular? Uh, because uh, it might just be nice to sort of set that stage in terms of, you know, your introduction to, the, to, to, to our sport and, and what you've been able to see of that. <laughs> Are you there? Are you talking to me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I missed. <laughs> Sorry. I thought you were talking to your audience. <laughs> So Corey, you knew nothing about hockey until we got together, right? Like field hockey. I, I actually did play a little. I think I remember telling you this because in BC you said, oh yeah, that's right. They actually have that in the phys ed program. Right. I don't know if they still do, but when I went to school in the eighties, like okay. uh, junior high and high school. So I did play a little bit and I remember being frustrated <laughs> because the stick was held on yeah. the right hand side Yeah. and I shoot left in yeah. golf and hockey. So I, you know, I just thought, okay, well, let's get this over with kind of like square dancing. It's like, okay, this is something to get through. Okay. So I didn't really appreciate it. Um, when I started to watch it, when you were just getting like really hardcore into watching games, recording games, 
Mm -hmm. I started to see it a lot more. Yes. And I remember there as well, I thought, this is weird because being a soccer player, when a ball is coming at me, my instinct, obviously thinking defensively, is you get your foot in the way. And here, people were, were like jumping to get their, like a, like a cat with boots on that's just like, oh, I don't like this, and, and getting their feet out of the way. And, and it took me a while to really get the mindset of how this sport works. Right. And then I started to, to see, okay, yeah, actually, this does make sense according to the rules of, of the game. And I could see the athleticism of it. And then you were educating me on, because I would see a call and I'd say, okay, what's that about? And over time, I, now I can see things happening. I don't know what your judgment of my uh, intelligence of what's going on is, but I feel a lot more knowledgeable about it oh, now yeah. than I did then. Oh yeah, you're really good at picking out fouls and you're like, isn't that this thing? And is isn't that and yeah, you're 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 really good when you're watching with me. And it's it's nice to be able to sit down and watch. Um I've just been scrolling through some of the comments to make sure that we didn't get too far uh lost. Um Kat here just saying it makes so much sense as to why her knees don't struggle as much when she's umpiring versus playing. And we're gonna get into the reasons why, because we're gonna we're gonna digest that um really hard. Digital Boot is here to say hi, as always, uh, from the live stream community. So nice to see you. Oh, Ian, you're late. I can't believe it. Um, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> David's just uh, endorsing me. That's very, very nice. Oh, Aline, you're, I was wondering where you were. Thanks for showing up. It's good to see you. Okay, so let's talk about some of the differences between backwards and forwards running other than the obvious, which is you're facing the other way. I caught onto that one really fast, but how about you talk about um, some of those differences in a general sense, because you were telling me about the differences between takeoff and landing and things like that. Yep. I, I have just one caveat before we get into this, mm -hmm. uh, and that's just that most of the research has been done at uh, for backward running at sub-maximal, so not at sprinting speeds. Okay. 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 Um, but so just to start off, normal running or forward forward running is is characterized by a hard landing. So if I use my hand as the the heel of your foot, mm -hmm. generally your your foot strikes, so it's a hard landing, then you break with the tibialis, the shin muscles, right. and then it the force goes into to the knee and into the hip and through the spine and, and whatnot. So it's a hard landing with a soft takeoff is how they describe it, because then you, you follow through, you roll, and then you accelerate by flexing the foot, the ankle, the knee, you know, using the, the calf and the hamstrings and the glute, okay. that kind of thing. And this is the, how I put it, the biomechanical reality of pretty much any animal that uh, exists here like they haven't found one that it doesn't work that way okay so it doesn't matter if it's a it's a running animal a hopping animal a trotting animal that hard landing and the soft takeoff is the same and that has to do you know however evolution works the the stretch reflex of taking the load and then accelerating and moving through that movement that's what works. Okay. So how was that different going backwards? So the difference with backward running is that the it's all in reverse. So it's basically all done the opposite. So as the foot strikes, you're actually catching the toes and then the ball of the foot. Then you're actually landing quite softly. So it's a softer landing. Okay. And then it, it moves up into the knee and the knee doesn't take as much force because of this, because of the softer landing. Okay. And then you shift the weight through and you're actually, depending on it, what speed you're moving, you're actually going to lift and flex your tibialis or the shin muscles, pulling the toes up if you're walking or pushing through with the quads and uh, the hip flexor to excel or to move yourself through, through a, a harder takeoff that in relation to that backward running softer 
landing. Okay. Oh, so instead really of cool. a hard landing, soft takeoff with the, the forward running, you've got a softer landing and then a harder takeoff. Okay. It takes more work to actually push through. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It sure does. And you were also explaining that there are different metabolic demands when you're running backwards. So what, what does that mean, a metabolic demand, and what, what are they? What, what, what's the difference? So in a nutshell, it's basically more work. It, it takes more effort to run okay. backward. And that has to do with we're not, um, what is it? We're not exploiting the stretch reflex that is the natural part of, like I said, running, trotting, hopping, jumping, that kind of thing. So the stretch reflex isn't there. And that has more to do with slowing braking when you're forward running and then taking off. So because we have to generate from that softer landing to then move through the movement from the land to the takeoff, it takes more effort for the body. So metabolically, it costs us more. Yep. So I think it's 30% less efficient, meaning you're going to go 30% slower. Right. And at the, as a result of that, you're actually going to work harder. So cardiovascularly, you're going to work harder. Right. Um, muscularly, you're going to work harder. So that's where that metabolic uh, cost comes in. Yeah. Because it's, it's just not the way we're built to run. Right. At, at peak efficiency. Right. Yeah. And we've, we've certainly felt that as we've gone out for our walks and runs. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, just a few comments from people coming, <laughs> coming through. First of all, Digital Boot is liking my overlays. So that's really cool. Um, Gopi, compare um, to others, most basketball players affected with knee injuries. And, but they're doing backwards running. Any specific reason for this issue? Um, this is kind of interesting. We'll talk about the injury prevention and that aspect of, of backwards running in performance versus how you train it in a minute. But this is a really good question, Gopi. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to star it and we're going to come back to it later. Uh, here's Simon Milford. I can't even sprint going forwards. No chance going backwards. And Simon, it's not about a dead out sprint at all. So we'll... We'll explain that further, but I think like you, I had that same first reaction, like, oh my God, running backwards. Are you kidding me? This is going to be like, I, I can barely, I can barely run forwards right now. Um, this sounds way too hard, but trust me, there's hope. Uh, Andy Waller, he's <laughs> practicing in his room. Uh, David just burned 1300 calories thinking about running backwards. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. So good work. Um, let's see, Andy, I think that running backwards, um, has to come natural. We could find ourselves getting distracted from the game, focusing on our movements. So plenty of practice. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And Andy, we're going to, we're going to get into that. So, um, Corey, you, you were also telling me about patellofemoral joint forces. So, um, I don't know how much people know about what the patellofemoral, um, is it, is it a joint? Is it an aspect? Can you, can you talk about that a little bit and explain? Because I've had patellofemoral syndrome. That was what I was first diagnosed with until the doctors actually realized, no, no, you just have flat-out osteoarthritis. Um, so what does that mean, and what does the backwards running do for that? So the, according to the research, they've calculated the compressive forces in the knee um, compared to forward running. So with the compression of the patella against the femur because of the, the impact when you're running forward, when you run backward, it's about 24% lower mm. just because of, again, the, the compression. Remember, this is the heel of the foot here because right. I don't want to stick my foot on camera and be all awkward. So <laughs> in, instead of striking... We don't like awkward here, so... <laughs> With, with forward running, you're generally absorbing heel, depending on, again, the stride and the velocity, right? Because if you're sprinting, you're not going heel-toe, heel-toe. Right. You might even be going a little bit more forefoot. But when you're sprinting, it's more on the toes. Right. 
Right. So sprinting is actually better for the knees than, you know, in quotes, jogging or just running. But when you're yes. running backward, you're actually absorbing more by landing on the ball of the foot. So then what's transferred up the shin doesn't go into the knees as much. So about 24% lower, according to the research. Um, and I'll just read, read something real quick here. So sure. that's relatively low running speeds again, because as you change the speeds, the research gets a little bit more difficult. So remember that little caveat there. Most of this research has been done on the, the lower speeds. Right. Um, but yeah, it's just the, the biomechanics of the stride itself. So th there have been running uh, uh, styles, again, more the, the jogging speeds. So more marathon pace. They're not sprinting through a marathon. So they have to actually have that efficiency of stride. And even in that case, they're trying to, to take less. I'm pointing to my elbow because that's my, my knee for these uh, purposes. Right. But the, even there, they're trying to limit or at least make it uh, less knee jarring. So with good running technique, it's less forward as well. But even if you don't know the mechanics that well of backward running, because of the way you do it, there's less force into that patellar joint with backward running okay very cool and i mean 25 percent or whatever the exact 20 ish percent um yeah percentages it's it's immaterial and that doesn't sound like a lot but that's actually like a lot accumulated over every single stride that we're taking so that's a massive massive difference so keep that in mind um, I want to talk just a little bit quickly about backwards running in umpiring specifically, because I want everybody at home to be framing this in terms of how we umpire and why I am so excited about this specifically for us. I mean, sure, players and other kinds of athletes out there, you know, you do you, but I care about what's happening with us. And when we are, and you are out there on the pitch, I think that this is a, going to be a crucial, crucial component that we need to add to our training because of what we are starting to do more regularly out on the pitch. So uh, one of the reasons that I did my, um, I've got the wrong camera on here. Um, one of the things that I talk about in my, um, my positioning workshop is about changing up the traditional notion of running on the outside of the pitch and you're taking a much more interior position. Now in this little diagram here, the little yellow guy, because sport plan doesn't let you flip them around, looks like he's running forwards to the, the towards the end line, but this would be a fairly typical attack transition running pattern. If you were, um, if you were running backwards towards that end line. So I'm looking at, and the way that I'm training it is to teach people to run that kind of distance on a regular basis, you might be running backwards for a full 23 meters or more each time that you are absorbing uh, a transitional attack. So if you look at the way that, uh, for example, Sarah Wilson is running here, um, she's running forwards at first because she needs the extra speed because remember, she's going to probably go 30% slower even if she's at a dead backwards sprint. And then she needs to be able to spin and turn herself around, but being able to run backwards helps her see the pitch and see the play so much better. Here's a shot of Dan Barstow, and he's doing this at the World Cup. He's a big proponent of the style of positioning as well, which uh, is really exciting to, to hear. And you can see that in, in the first... Um, aspect of this this clip and he's still adjusting sort of on the side end but he's he's backpedaling off to that end line so we as umpires I think in order to be able to take advantage of what we are now experiencing with faster play aerial play and more direct attacks and just the, the ball moving faster as well as the players that we need to be much more, we need to be much better at being in our happy place earlier in our mission critical area. And 
we can have a better presence, a better view if we are doing a lot of backwards running. And it's really funny. I was thinking about this this morning because when I was growing up as an umpire, I got in trouble if I ever tried to run backwards. They were like, don't ever do that. That's too risky. And it was like, it was like the wrong thing to do, which is hilarious because now we have to do it. So given that we're doing it and we, we're doing it in games, we need to train it, right? So Corey, let's talk about some of the training benefits. So even if we weren't doing this because it's going to help us in matches, what are the training benefits to adding backwards running to your regular fitness program? I did want to mention one thing that the first example, sorry, I don't know the name of the umpire of the woman with the blonde hair. Sarah. Yeah. Sarah Wilson. Okay. Yeah. Something that, that I, that I want to make sure that the umpires watching, if there are any non umpires watching, um, watch that, that clip and you'll see that her, her head is following the play. So she's running forward, but she's still watching the play. And then it's, it, she just pivots and her eyes are still watching the play. Mm -hmm. So when you do practice backward running, you're going to, you're going to start fairly conservatively just right. to get the pattern of it. So it's going to be in a, in an open field, hopefully, or if you can find a track somewhere with a, you know, like a running track and that's rubberized. So got a really good grip on it mm -hmm. and pick a lane and then you can watch the lane itself. So you can, make sure that you're going in a straight line. That's how you start. And you start with walking and then, you know, you start running a little bit faster, but in a game situation, when you get to that level, what you want to do when you practice, um, before we get into the why you should, you want to practice actually following something as well. Right. So it's not just, Hey, I'm just running backwards. It's like, no focus on something, run forward, Keep your focus on it. Switch to running backward. Keep your, your focus on that. So start with a stationary uh, point to look at. So let's say, you know, like my fingers here and I'm doing my backward running and I'm going to focus on that one stationary place and then I'm going to switch to maybe forward running or vice versa, right? Where yeah. I'm trying to pay attention to it. Yeah. And or then what it, you're going to start to do. Yeah, if you had somebody running with you and they were – you know, they were like simulating being a ball carrier, but you know, they could be doing right. the same running pattern as well, but you're, you know, they're sort of running towards you as you're running forwards and then you switch to backwards and you're just keeping your eye on them. That's what I should be doing with you when we're doing our backwards running in the field. Cause I was thinking that that was something that felt a little weird. My head just felt kind of like I was doing, you know, th there right. wasn't anything. Yeah. There wasn't anything I was focusing on. So that, that, that's a really, really good point. Um, yeah. And that's part of scaling, right? Mm -hmm. You have to start, you have to start back of what your goal yeah. is because you can't just start at, Hey, I'm going to sprint okay. full speed during a match and of it's going to be great. You have of to course. work your way up to that. So, and, and, and that's what so many, so many of us are doing, right. And especially as so many of us are returning to hockey from a long lockdown is that people have been doing all kinds of really great uh, fitness programs with running every day or going for tons of hikes and lots of bike rides. And they're, they've been very active. And a lot of 13 people have gotten into really good shape over the lockdown, but it hasn't been at all umpire specific. And then suddenly you're throwing yourself out onto the pitch to do a match. And mm -hmm. is it any surprise if some of us get injured or we don't feel comfortable or we don't we're, we're distracted by our own movements so we're not umpiring the way that we should so we definitely mm -hmm. need to start training this but I want to get back into those general training benefits because I think it's really important for people to hear that we're not just doing this because it makes us better umpires obviously that's the most important thing but what about the general benefits yeah there's there's lots any any movement in itself, I mean, the body is made to move and that that has to do with just general health, right? Like sitting or just standing isn't good enough. The brain was made to be ported around by the body. And mm -hmm. so anytime we move the body, it's good. So there's tons of benefits, just like any exercise. So I'll just go through a, a few of them. Um, 
improved balance mm -hmm. because moving backward is a unique sensation. It's going to feel a little awkward and it's going to feel like, oh, I'm not safe. And that's why you start with slower pace, just walking. Right. Get used to that. Get used to walking up a slight incline and then going down a slight incline and then turning around in a circle, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So a field works great for this. Yeah. Right. Somewhere soft where if you if you do fall or stumble, then mm -hmm. if you just, you know, make sure you don't reach back with your arms and and hurt your wrists, but just kind of get used to you might actually want to even practice falling a little bit, just a nice slow pace. Uh, so your proprioception, how okay. it feels to move backward is, is, a, is a part of that learning the balance as well, because all of a sudden it's like being upside down. We used to do it a lot as children, as adults, we, we're not upside down a lot. So anytime we, we change what we usually do, the brain has to figure this out and sort it out. So that's, that's big balance and proprioception. Um, you improve the, the, the quad to the hamstring or the, the front of the thigh to the back of the thigh relationship, the agonist antagonist. And the reason being, like I was saying before, the quads have to work harder to propel you backward than it does propelling you forward, which is more of a hamstring glutes activity, which is why sprinters pull their hamstrings a lot, right? They have to right. make sure. So the the strength ratio between quads to hamstrings has to keep up depending on the movement so if you don't practice running backward you might get an imbalance there mm -hmm. but even running backward it transfers to strength running forward because now the quads are stronger therefore the ratio of the strength to the back side of the leg gets a little bit closer as well and there's a ratio there that you can research if you really want to get into it, if you're really loading in the gym or something, but okay. um, I'm getting into the weeds here. Yeah. Um, basically just, you'll get better at it. So you're, you're improving your skill of doing it. That's, that's pretty obvious in its own way because okay. that brain body connection of okay. moving through space backward a little bit into the proprioception, but uh, it helps prevent injuries as well. And that has to do with not only, getting better at the skill, but that front leg to back leg, um, even the flexion and extension of the foot at the ankle, uh, the hip extension, the hip flexion, that kind of thing. Right. So those are a few of the benefits, not to mention all the cardio, you know, pulmonary, right. the cardiovascular enhancement and, and just general fitness all around getting yeah. the, the breath. And, yeah. and some of the research that you were looking into was talking about how um, athletes were uh, getting more explosive and they were getting faster just by adding backwards running into their training regimens. So Gopi's question earlier when he was talking about how basketball <clears throat> players, um, yeah, I mean, just, just like hockey players, they, they do a lot of work in a game running backwards, but how much do they actually train? Like when, when, but I mean, my, my stepson, when he played basketball, he was, he was doing tons of suicides, but they were always running forwards mm -hmm. and maybe they would do some side shuffling things, but very little of the training work was done backwards. So, um, so what, did, what did you learn about the, uh, the increased performance that you would get just by tr adding backwards running to your program? Well, depending, some of the research shows that, that training this movement, and there's a little bit more to it than just doing the backward running. Like there are exercises that you can do just like any type of cross training that, that focuses on like, uh, like I'll, I'll, mentioned the Peterson step up. And this is named after Carl Peterson, who was a physiotherapist and he worked with Canadian skiers actually. Right. And he was trying to come up with a way to make sure that the skiers had healthy knees because obviously they take a lot of abuse. That's, that's all shock absorption as they're going down the hill. This is downhill skiing, not cross country. Yeah. And so there's, there's a movement where you are just, doing like stepping down off a step, but then 
coming back up without taking the foot off that step. Right. If that describes it well enough, yeah. um, you can look it up. Carl Peterson step up and that the, the Peterson is all E. So P E T E R S E N. Okay. And so, but the, the research was one on adolescent boys, for example, and this was pertaining specifically to basketball mm -hmm. with the backward focus training. And this was sled pulls running, and these, these types of step up activities for every inch gained in the forward running and the traditional training, the adolescent boys were gaining four inches of jump height with the backward training. So wow. it's, it's very explosive yeah. and it has to do with the muscles around the knee in the posterior position. So that's that, uh, you know, the vastus medialis, the lateralis, the rectus femoris and, uh, and the intermediates, but the muscles around the knee itself, it's, it's just creating that strength for jumping in that case. Now, if you're just talking about general health again, and, mm -hmm. and general knee health, the backward running is much more focused on the concentric, meaning the muscle shortens as the joint uh, basically extends. So like, uh, think of a, if again, if this is my knee and I'm doing leg extensions on a machine, something right. that I don't recommend just because it isolates the muscles, but sometimes in rehab that is necessary, yeah. but a Peterson step up would be the same motion. It's that extension of the knee and backward running focuses very much on that concentric extension of the knee and a shortening of the muscle. So you're really strengthening the muscles around the knee in that case, without the general shock that happens when you're running forward. And even when you're walking. So if you wanna up your game a little bit, start easy again, but you can, like I say, start walking backward up a hill. Mm -hmm. And some people then accelerate that, not accelerate necessarily, but they, they work a steeper hill. And then eventually they can try to sprint backward up a hill. So you can imagine doing repeated explosive leg extensions as you're sprinting backward up a hill. And that creates a lot of um, strength around the knee joint at the okay. front. Now, just before I move on or before you go to your next question or point, as far as basketball injuries, mm -hmm. There is a lot of side to side in basketball. There's a lot of jumping and there's a lot of landing in situations that the knee is not just a nice linear. This is all safe and good. I know exactly where everything is. So knee injuries in athletic, especially competitive environments is going to go up. Yeah. On a, on a field hockey pitch, the players generally have a little bit more room to respond. Basketball, it's all very contained. And there is no give on a basketball floor. Like their, their feet are basically, as soon as they hit, they stick to the floor and they want that. But because of that, the force goes up into the knees. Yeah. And so their training has to be not just linear. Right. They have to be, they have to be working that side to side. Right. Right. And that absolutely if they've been brought up with that, that's great. But you sometimes get weekend warriors where, Hey, I haven't played basketball. Kind of like what happened to me with soccer. I haven't played basketball since I was in high school. Let's go and do it. And, you know, maybe a little bit more competitive than they need to be. And they start trying to pull the moves off and that's where the knees can have some injuries. Absolutely. So hopefully I answered that question. Yep, absolutely. Really Speaking of questions, there's there's a few here that I think would be really good to get into. So um, our friend Kat here, she's she's saying that when she's running forward, she struggles with her knee pain, but when she runs backwards, she struggles with her shins hurting. Do you have any advice or input as to what might be going on for for Kat there? That's actually interesting because backward running shouldn't shouldn't exacerbate or even aggravate any shin issues. Is it possible that so maybe it it's might... because she's she's doing too much for like too soon? And if she started training backwards movement, 
more gradually that she developed that that shin strength or whatever it might if that's not the right term then you know tell me but it it may be by developing that more slowly and building up that endurance that will help her you know with that well it it would depend i i would have to see the stride itself Mm -hmm. because i i was telling you about how so again if this is my knee and this is the heel of my foot and the toes here I like when I'm walking to actually pull the toes up. So I'm actually flexing my shin. So the shin splints aren't actually like, it sounds like your bone is splinting, right? Like splinters of the bone. But basically what it is, is the pulled shin or tibialis muscle, right? And so when you, when you're going backward, you're actually absorbing here. The only way that you'd be actually maybe feeling it in the front of the shin here is if you're aggressively pulling the toes up. Mm -hmm. So that might be what's going on here. That's, I'm hazarding a guess. Okay, Kat, send us a video. Send us a video and we'll have a look. Or Corey, I'll have a look. And I'll I'll just look at it and go, hmm. (laughs) But Corey, I'll give you, you know, maybe some some suggestions and some input. Obviously, you know, Corey's a personal trainer and he's not offering medical advice on this show or in any show. But, uh, but as a personal yeah. trainer, you know, he, he can give some suggestions and advice. And I'll, and I'll mention that the shin splint comes from now I'm running forward here. And again, this is the heel of the foot here. Yeah. It's that breaking of the force from the ankle through to the, the ball of mm. the foot. Okay. And it's that elongating of the muscle. That's that eccentric contraction. Right. So the muscles contracted and it's trying to slow you down. Interesting. So we were talking about this the other day where walking down a hill yeah. will make your legs more sore yes. than walking up a hill. Yes. And the reason for that is that the difference between the, the concentric it- contraction, when you're walking up a hill, you're actually making your muscle shorter to climb. Right. But when you're coming down the hill, your your foot, in this case, the tip of my foot here, as the knee bends, I'm trying to slow myself down. So this muscle is actually lengthening Mm -hmm. and that you can, you can, you're stronger in that range, but there's usually a lot of force and that's the way muscles are built and it works that way, but it causes more, you know, in quotes, damage to the muscle that way. So that's That's where shin splints come from. That's, that's very interesting. Um, just for umpiring specific from positioning perspective, Rachel is saying that she can do this with the backwards running, but you're constantly worried about players being behind mm-hmm. you. Now that's when, that's when you got to come to my workshop and I'll, I'll tell you how to, how to fix that. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we are still in the habit of being too close to the play. And if you're going to take the, the, the modern positioning and if you're going to be interior and you're going to be mission critical, you have to be much further ahead of the play than you used to be being on the outside. And, but the dividends, trust me, are super worth it. So, um, so there you go. Let's see. So Simon had a question here. Um, is this why having run a long distance marathon, is it really hard to walk downstairs? the following day is backwards running would backwards running help with that is that the way simon's putting that together does that make sense to you i would there's it depends on the terrain of the marathon i would Mm -hmm. imagine i mean i think they generally try to keep it fairly level where there's not a lot of hill climbing Uh, i'm not a marathon person or something yeah i'm not really sure yeah but I would think that that would just be general soreness as it is because running a marathon, unless you train for them a lot, generally people try to peak with the marathon itself, not having run perhaps yeah. that distance. But if you're doing again, all I'm that, speculating. If you're doing all that concentric heel strike landing and, and there's, or, or there's that, there's all that breaking effect. Then if suddenly you're walking downstairs and you're having to do all that breaking, that would make sense that you'd be really tired in that motion the day after, right? Possibly, yes. Yeah. It, and that would have to do with the, the running stride itself, yeah. for sure. And because, yeah, running efficiently across that distance 
that's a, that is a feat yeah. to do, right? Uh, pardon the pun. I know you love puns. <laughs> do I ever? <laughs> Wait. There we go. <laughs> and he's just saying he loves a good way to step up. Absolutely. Um, the the Peterson step up that we're talking about this so this is something we're we're gonna we're gonna get into concrete stuff um right away here uh once i get all the questions answered and what what you and i have been working on in order to help my knee rehabs and and (laughs) knees rehabilitation and to help me get back to running activity and umpiring and playing um but Let's just make sure I haven't missed anything. Oh, Katerina, when Tony Parker had a major, I remember him, had a major knee injury. I saw his rehab de- documentary and he was working mm-hmm. backwards up a hill. Yeah, absolutely. So that's exactly, um, <laughs> you know, you were better spelling it the first time, Kat. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So you're going to send that along. It does feel like shin splints. All right, let's, let's figure that out. That's interesting. Um, Andy's looking for some good stretches. So to include in the pregame warm up. Okay. We're going to talk about soon. Andy, it's like you didn't watch my short. I did a whole YouTube short. I'll, I'll pull it up on the screen in a second and we'll go through that. And I had Corey demonstrate all the exercises even very important, but we'll do that. Okay. Crispy always found going downstairs harder than going up after a marathon. Yeah. Crispy is one of my long distance running friends. That I'm trying to get to stop doing that. But there you go. Okay, so let's get into concrete stuff. So you and I decided a few weeks ago, or you had been bugging me, and then I finally said, fine, let's do it. Let's go walking backwards outside. So we started very slowly. Now, I think a lot of people have been listening, and thanks for sticking around through this whole thing. It's it's great to have you along, but we wanted to make sure that you understood the... Um, what the science knows about this now and backwards running is not new it's not like you know you, Corey, you were telling me that people in china do this like all the time and and the knees over toes guy claims that this is why they have such a low incidence of knee replacements in their mm-hmm. aging population because they backwards walk all the time those crazy chinese mm-hmm. folk so you and i started walking backwards out on the sidewalks, didn't we? And we would spot mm-hmm. each other, right? And we started going, um, so we have a little loop that we, we've been doing just because it's nice to go on a familiar terrain that you, you know where the cracks are and you know where the bushes are and the signposts and things like that. So it's the, fir- the first couple walks were a little bit, I was like, hold, remember I was holding on to you, Corey? I, had, like, yeah. <laughs> I was holding on to your arm the very first time because I was really scared. I was really scared that I didn't have the balance and that I was just going to, I don't know, I was going to step on something and just fall because that's how impaired my my proprioception felt but every day it's gotten better the point now that you know we go and I just keep myself facing backwards I'm like the spotter I can see the thieves coming up sneaking up from behind and you're the one who sees the the ones who are going to ambush us from the front and we we go on this loop and we've been adding um like I've been adding more time on my backwards walking right? Every time. So at first we just did 10 minutes and then I was doing like more like 12 and now we've, you know, I'm doing most of the route now walking backwards, right? So that was a good way to warm up. But we, as we come to the end of this loop, we go into a field that's just over there. I'm just pointing like you can see it, can't you? Um, and we, and we go out there and we ha- have started doing some sprints now your backwards running is a lot more like a sprint than my backwards running is but again the very first time I tried it I just did maybe like 20 meters 25 meters and then I stopped and went oh okay that was kind of interesting and I saw how that felt and then I tried another 25 meters and then I was like okay that's good I literally did two 25 meter sprints along with my walking backwards and that was all I did to add on so and, and then, you know, and now we've been adding it up. How far do you think we do when we do between the two football goals? How far do you think that is? That's about th- th- three quarters of a three soccer quarters? field. I don't yeah. know what that would so be. It's probably, it's probably about 70 meters, I would say. 
And so now we're doing maybe five or six. Oh yeah, now I don't even exist on this one. Um, <laughs> don't worry, everybody. Don't worry, everybody. I'll come over here at some point. Oops, no, I don't want to knock lock. I don't want to lock that overlay. I need to bring myself into the picture here. Um, I don't know why this is getting so hard for me, but there we go. Okay, hi, I'm back. So yeah, so we're now doing like five or six of those 70 meter sprints and then doing some of those Peterson step ups on the goals in the middle and things like that. But here's a, a uh, an example, Corey, that you found of uh, an introductory backward running program that people can give a shot so that, um, you know, they can get started. So can you take us through this and explain what we're doing and I will make this available to everybody as a download off the website. But what, what does this all mean? What does it say? I should so, put my glasses. Yeah, this is a nice introductory way to get into backward running. And if you go to the first column, number one there, and the first training session, then the idea is Initially, you're going to pick a distance, say, 15 to 20 meters. So if you could mark off 15 to 20 meters in a field, you know, someplace where, again, soft landing, if you do happen to trip yourself up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And from one cone to the next, you're going to run in that first, first couple of laps, we'll say, at about a 40 to 55% of what you would consider to be a fast backward run. So just getting warmed up and then about five of those repetitions, total of 15, you're going to do it at a little bit faster. So 60 to 75%. And this is all subjective, right? So especially when you're getting started, you're just going to have to experiment. Like you're going to have to just guess and, and say, okay, what feels like a 40 to 55%? What's, what's about half the speed that I could go. And then what's about three quarters of the speed that I could go. And so then you're getting a total volume. And if you notice that as you go from the left side, to number one, two, three, four, your volume stays the same, but what's changing is the speed and the repetitions at those different speeds. So in the second workout that you do, you're actually going to start to introduce a little bit of a faster pace, maybe even all out. I wouldn't recommend that right away, of course, but if you get up to about 90%, maybe even 80 to 90, we'll say that would be good for a couple of repetitions, but that same distance, right? Mm -hmm. That 15 to 20 meter or yeah, meters. Okay. And then as you get, as you get closer to being more comfortable and you get to that three and fourth column, then you're introducing more of the fast runs, but you're always going to start slowly, work your way into it. You might even just want to walk, right? So this is just a very structured way of putting it together. And I found this um, article and it was written by four different coaches. It actually it might've been even been five, but uh, they are very much into the research on back running, which is where I got quite a bit of this information, not just them, but they had a lot of it. Right. Okay. That's really good. So I actually did create a shortcut to that entire article that Corey just talked about. Uh, if you go to fhumpires.com forward slash BWP, you can find it. And this diagram is in that article, right? Yes. Okay. And then they actually have other, other tables that go into even greater intensity. Right. So that you start to actually incorporate faster r speeds and a little bit uh, longer distances. Okay. So or this is greater this is volume. A, so this is a really nice place for people to start if they're ready to start doing some of the running and some of the sort of the, the, the speed work. But like I was saying before, if you're like me and you've been recovering from, how many people out there are like me and are recovering from two traumatic <laughs> knee surgeries? Um, but if, if, you, if you want to start slowly, absolutely do that and just start with your walking and just get yourself feeling familiar. Now, Corey and I have been talking about it and I'm not, I guess of all the things like Corey, you're kind of like the guy who's like, I'm going to try this for 20 weeks and I'm going to do this regimented program. And then I'm going to measure my results from here to here. And 
and then I'm going to find out if I like it. I'm the kind of person who, if I don't see results very quickly, I get a little bumped quite quickly. I'm quite a skeptic, right? Would you agree mm. with that? That I'm a, I'm an exercise yeah. skeptic. I've really been finding like the first couple times that I went backwards walking i'm kind of like well this isn't too hard but again we took it really slowly at first but i really felt different after just a few sessions of this where i felt like i was more athletic if that makes any sense i felt more balanced i felt more agile that was the word i couldn't find yesterday when we were talking about this remember when i kept mm. saying i just feel more mobile no it's agile like I feel yeah. like I can, I can, I can move laterally better. I can, you know, jump up from a seated position faster, more easily. And these are the feelings that for me, rehabbing these surgeries have been, you know, I, I was really scared. I was never going to get back to this place, you know, and it's amazing to me that something as simple as just turning around and walking the other way could to, could do this and it's it really is not you, like you don't have to go hard at it and you don't have to do a ton of it but just you know every couple of days we go out for this walk and now we're starting to add more of the runs and it's just it's making so so much difference I can't wait to get back on a pitch and like try it and see and sort of see how I feel so go ahead and go to fhempires.com forward slash bwp and Backwards running program is what that stands for. So BWP and go have a look. Um, I'm going to head. <laughs> I, I froze the frame on the, on the most flattering uh, picture of myself, obviously, because that's how I roll. But um, uh, who asked about the warm up exercises? Go to this short, everybody. Because um, here's Corey, just like uh, Niels pointed out in the comments. He said that... Uh, you were wearing the swag in the short and he punched that out. So this kind of, what is, what's the advantage of doing this kind of dynamic warm up? So I think the question was specifically about stretches and that may, it may have been Andy, but what's the difference between doing sort of what we would consider the standard stationary stretches as opposed to this kind of much more um, rigorous, um yeah dynamic warm-up well with the relaxed stretching as they typically call it you're actually relaxing so that's not what you want before you're active right that's what you do after right when you want to when you want to cool things down uh not immediately again because if your heart rate's really high and you just sit down you know that can be problematic in itself you want to get into that slowly start on your feet. But the, the reason for the dynamic stretching is as you're like, for example, the leg swings, mm -hmm. you actually have to lift your leg. So you're activating muscles while you're stretching. Right. So you're, you're, you're contracting the agonist and then you're relaxing the antagonist and you're moving through a range of motion that hopefully is something that is applicable to your sport. Right. So Absolutely. you don't have to do, um, everything, but what would be the most helpful and in running, especially like field hockey, that kind of thing, you know, it's hips, knees, ankles, um, even just the stability of the supporting leg when you're doing some of this balancing. So when I was doing that step forward and hug your knee to your chest, right. you're balancing on the other leg. So the ankle yeah. is getting some work, right? Because you're trying to fight for your balance if you're, if you're losing it. Yeah. So you want to be, you want to start to amp up your activity, not sit down, lean forward and hold a stretch for 30 seconds. That's right. not going to help you be active. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting. Cause I mean, obviously throughout your career as a personal trainer, you've seen things sort of coming and going and, and, mm -hmm. and the, the, the way that we, you know, decide that we should train or we should warm up. And, you know, it's like, it's like opposite day with, compared to what you and I would have done when we were in teenagers or in our twenties, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's now like, yeah, get it moving. And when I did the research for that short, uh, one of the things that I was really interested in was just the conversation about how getting your metabolic processes activated. So 
getting your heart rate up, but also just getting all of those, um, you know, brain to body neuron connections firing actually prepares your, um, prepares the blood glucose so that you are going to make better decisions in the match. So if you walk into a match without doing any kind of warm up, you're selling yourself short because it's going to take some time for your body to catch up to the needs that your brain have to think through all of your decisions. So I found that fascinating and I did never, I, I just thought, okay, your brain and your body, they're completely independent things. They don't relate to each other and you know, whatever, but actually they're very intimately connected. And that's kind of one of the thing that we're, one of the things that we're learning through science a lot more. Let, let me get, I can, I can hear my little comments pinging, so I don't want to miss too many, but um, Jan Decker saying in general, indoor sport players uh, used to run backwards, or m- maybe he's saying that they're more accustomed to running backwards. Absolutely. That's, that's part of being in a smaller space and you tend to just do that. Uh, Andy, it's on your list. You promise. Yeah. You better watch that short, sir, and like it and subscribe to my channel. YouTube.com forward slash FA Jumpires. There you go. Oh, so here's a question on the, on the backwards running program, the verbal feedback. I had that question too. I didn't know what that meant. Simon's asking if, is that when you're swearing after you fall over, you see right down at the bottom row there, Corey, what does that mean? (laughs) No, that that's specifically for the technique of it. And also to make sure that they're staying within, if they're supposed to be going slow, okay, you're going at a good speed there, Okay, but also, okay, pick up your knees a little bit more, stretch out your stride. It's trying to help. I I think that they did this for, for a youth group. Uh, Uh, I can't remember exactly, but yes, it was from the coach to the athlete in this case. That's adorable. Okay. Andy, thanks for plucking out the, the link. I did manage to show it. There you go. Uh, oh my God, says Kat. That's it. After lockdown and not umpiring for so many months, that's what I was struggling with. Agility backwards running for the win. Yes, she's starting right away. That's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about. And don't forget to like the stream, says Niels. Excellent. Static versus dynamic. Scott, you're absolutely right. And Andy is like, I do all the above, some more dynamic ones. Give it a shot, Andy. I mean, again, this is kind of like umpiring techniques and when Corey and I were talking about how we were going to approach this session, I wanted to make sure that people understood that it's like, there's not a right way or wrong way to do anything really, but it's worth trying things that show exciting promise. And if you can do some measurements, so Corey, you were talking about how it would be interesting for us to go out with marker cones and measure some distances and just sort of test our speed and not to like put pressure on ourselves. I certainly don't need any pressure these days, but to, to measure out how fast we're running forwards and backwards at certain intervals, like in, we test it now and we test it again in a month or six weeks or whatever you were thinking that we, we might want to try. And Mm -hmm. that way we'd have some, something more concrete than just our, um, our feelings as to how we thought this was working out. So I'm interested in doing that because I, I think it would be nice to quantify. I do really trust my body. I trust, I trust what I'm sensing and the messages that I'm getting. I like my brain body connection and my, my body tells me interesting things. And I really like how I feel when I'm doing all this backwards work. So, so yeah, I think that's something there. What does Mr. Z have? All of those years of misguided soccer playing and knee issues could have been helped by Corey's great advice. Oh, look at that. Well, again, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. It's not that, you know, Corey is making this up or I'm making this up. This is, you know, people have been backwards running since the beginning of time. It's just that things come and go, right? And we have different trends. And I think we're starting to realize that this is something that we shouldn't have forgotten and we need to bring back into our physical regiments. So, so there you go, Zed, anytime you want to come backwards, walking and running with Corey and I just come on down, we'll be your spot. And we'll, we'll go to the McDougal park field. It's really soft. I haven't fallen yet, but I'm sure it's, 
I'm sure it's on the way. As soon as I start to really try to truck it backwards, it's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be really difficult. So if anybody else has any other questions, get them in now, because I think we've kind of wrapped up a lot of that. Corey, did you have anything else that you wanted to wrap up with some summary thoughts or anything you, you think that we, we missed? Yeah. Uh, one thing I want to say for sure is that uh, backward running is just one method, one exercise, mm -hmm. one way of thinking about being healthy and having solid knees. It's not a panacea. Right. Th there are more, again, this is, this is very linear. So just like sprinters don't make good soccer players because they train to sprint in one straight line. And when you're playing a game, same with field hockey, the athletes themselves have to be able to zigzag and change direction and stop almost immediately and, and go the other direction. Mm -hmm. So, and umpires themselves, uh, they have to react to what's going on in the field. They, right. they think, okay, that's where the play's going. And then all of a sudden, oh, it's not going that way all of a sudden. And it, it you know, they zig when they should have zagged. Yeah. So the, the warmups, the what you do to train to be fitter for your activity it has to get closer and closer to those competitive scenarios mm -hmm. so if you just train in straight lines whether you run forward or backward that's not going to cut it when you get on onto the pitch or if you're indoor right so it this isn't like, oh, I've solved all my knee problems. I'm just going to do this and it's all great. That takes, this will take you so far. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands that zigging and zagging as well, changing right. direction, which we haven't gotten into. Right. Those are completely different forces on the knee now. And that knee structure, I don't know if Keely was talking about it, but it's not super stable. It's got a little bit of play when you start to bend it, right? Yeah. It's only ever... It's only ever a hinge joint when it's completely locked and then it's not moving. As soon as you start to bend it, it can actually play a little bit from side to side as well. And when you start to push those parameters, that's when knee injuries happen and, and MCLs get blown and, yeah, uh, you know, absolutely. things go all wonky and, oh no, now how do I play my sport? Yes. The main thing that you want to do is you want to be as healthy as possible so that any training that you do make use of it's it's cumulative as yes. opposed to yeah i'm making all kinds of progress oh no i'm hurt yeah and then now it's like three steps back okay where do i now i have to work myself back up to where i was yeah so training you want to be as safe as possible with the training even as you start to push those different parameters right it's only in competition where the safety kind of goes out the window because now you're being competitive and you think, okay, I, I can sacrifice myself a little bit or make those split second decisions. But when you are conditioning the body for the sport or for yeah. the event, if you're an umpire, then that is when you want to be as safe as possible and, and trying to get close to competitive intensity. Yeah. That, so that's what so I mean. You're saying that we, say. we do this safely so that we can be as healthy as possible so we can train consistently. Those right. Are the keys. And don't, and it. don't train through pain. I don't know if we talked about this yet, but that was one thing that I really wanted to make sure. Okay. I think I mentioned it a little bit. Yeah. Like when I made that decision, when I felt something in my Achilles and I just thought, see, that's a competitive environment. I made a poor decision, but it was like split second mm -hmm. because I was like, Oh, something went wrong there, but I need to stop this person from getting any further with the ball. Right. If the, if that had been a scrimmage during a practice, I would have immediately pulled up and just said, yeah, sorry. Hey coach, yeah. I'm hurt. Yeah. And I wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't have been hurt as badly, but I just kept going. So yeah. There you go. Don't train through pain. Okay. Here's Aline is saying that was a good session. It was interesting. And now she knows some things that she didn't know, kind of like every week, really. Good. That's the whole point. If I'm telling you things that you already knew, well, it's nice to get things confirmed, but it's better to learn. And I learn something every time as well. So that's awesome. Rachel's definitely going to try to add a few short backwards portions to your daily walks. Good. 
like just start small, start very small and see how it feels. Pay attention to your body and go, okay, what is this strange thing? And how does it, feel? okay, it's good. I like this. I'm going to add a little bit more. And I, I've, I, I'm not going to say it was addictive, but I got good feedback and I said, yeah, this is worth doing a little bit more. And now going, going up that sharp hill that we go up, Corey is just really interesting. These backwards sessions will go on Strava. Yeah, that's sort of the interesting part. I said this yesterday when we were out, Corey, didn't I? That I said, I wish Apple Watch had a workout for backwards running because mm -hmm. it looks like I'm not going very fast. And it's, you know, like I'm not getting the same sort of credit in my workout, <laughs> even though my heart yeah. rate is higher and Apple Watch is probably going, you know, she's only going about, you know, 2K an hour. Why is she breathing so hard? But um yeah, that's, it's definitely an interesting point. Who knows? Maybe they'll, they'll get up to speed with that. And Andy, all this reminds me of Keely giving out to me about sideways skipping doing a game. Uh-huh. Yep. See, it all links up together. None of that sideways skipping stuff. There you go. Um, let's see. Do you advise training both things in one session? Uh, example, zigzag and backwards running. What do you think about that, Corey? For sure. Yeah. Because you're going to do both in a, in a, in a competitive or in a, this is when I need to be on. So mm -hmm. again, it's getting close to what do you do when you need to be on? And if you do zigzag running and backward running and forward running and side to side in a match, then yeah. that's what you need to do in practice. Yeah, absolutely. Leading up to. 100% intensity, but yeah. again, in practice, doing it as safely as possible so you don't get hurt. Yeah. Um, yep. I was trying to estimate the sort of complete guesswork in my head as to how much backwards running I do using the new positioning technique in a game. And I would say that I'm probably spending maybe 15 to 20% of my time jogging backwards of all the distances that I was running. Um, so that's pretty high. I don't think that that means that we should only train 15 to 20% of our running that way, but I think it means that we need to do a lot more than we're doing. So um, part of this, you know, Corey, like you were mentioning that the research is a little nascent and it's not necessarily, they're not saying that this is maximal load results and and that sort of thing. But I think if you, if you, you know, did, if you do more, <laughs> it'll obviously be an improvement. Um, Andy was, was asking, what about doing suicides, but facing the same direction the whole time? See, this is what I was talking about, Corey, when I was describing fifties. Now this was a, okay. um, a training running thing that, that I did when I was playing dinos, uh, for the university of Calgary dinos. And we would, um, we'd be on the pitch and we would walk 50, jog 50, stride 50, sprint 50. So it was, you know, the jog was like a 50%. The stride was a 70% effort and a sprint was, you know, 90%. And that kind of distance speed ratio gave us the right kind of recovery, according to our coach, um, who really liked that system. And we do like 10 of those or 12 of those or 15 of those. And I was thinking it would be really interesting to just go. Um, uh, it, w it would be interesting to, you know, to walk. And uh, how, how did I describe it to you? I don't remember. But it would involve turning. Change direction. Yeah, changing yeah. directions at certain times so that you are going backwards the whole time, or you're just going, you're facing one direction. I would try everything. I would just, you know, see what it was like if I just walked forwards, uh, jogged backwards, strode forwards, and then sprinted backwards, for example. Like that would be, that would be cool to give a try. And that's something that maybe, you know, you and I can try, but we were also talking about doing the transition between forward and backwards in mid segment. So mm -hmm. you could be walking forwards for 10 meters and then you turn around as you would, as if the play was starting to, 
the play was coming towards you, but you had more time. And then you turn around and you walk for the remaining 40 meters backwards. And then you hit the line and then you start jogging for 10 meters forwards. And then you do the turn and you were talking about your focus point and keeping your focus point somewhere as you would if you were watching the play. Mm -hmm. And you would be turning, you know, you would be turning the same way, you know, each time because we don't turn away from the play. We only turn towards it. Yeah. But I'd, I'd worry about, sh about not doing both just for, for balance purposes. But anyway, that, like that's an idea of a, of a way to do things. And that's something that you and I are going to, you and I are going to be trying soon. Okay. You don't have to do it, Corey, but that's what's something I'm going to do because I want to get myself back to, to umpiring. And, and I wanted to mention as well, the, the comment about, yeah, make sure, or you can use zigzag and backward and forward in one training session, but you don't have to either, right? Mm -hmm. You can, you can do one and then the other the next day or combine two of them and then do one by itself, that kind of thing. It's just that it's not a bad thing to combine them as well, because that is very natural. That's yeah. very naturally what's going to happen. Like with uh, Sarah that you were saying there, she, she was running forward and then she pivoted and ran backward and it yeah. was so smooth and you could just see her head on a swivel as it yeah. followed the play as her body moved through space. And I thought, yeah, that's, yeah. that's a really good example. Yeah. And that's something that would probably be well worth practicing because you go into that, that karaoke type step where you're changing yeah. You're staggering the feet so that you can change your direction as you run and do it both directions, right? So that you get used to not just turning one way. Yeah. Not skipping, Andy, but karaoke. Karaoke. That's what I always called it. Karaoke. Grapevine. That's, that's what I learned in dance. Yeah. Grapevine. Yeah. Anyway. I don't remember how to Whatever. pronounce it. A uh, question from Andrea. What surface is best to train on sidewalk, turf, or grass? To think? start, I would go uh, soft. Yeah. If you're just walking, I mean, concrete's fine. Um, yeah. If you feel good about it, if you feel like, oh, no, I'm confident. But if you, if you even have a little bit of hesitation, like, oh, I don't know, then what I was saying is go somewhere soft, like a nice field, mm -hmm. and even practice falling. Yeah. Like practice stumbling and, and just see, okay, what does that feel like? Okay, I'm still safe. I can, I can fall. Yeah. And I can do it safely. So yeah, once you learn how to fail successfully, then you can, you get a little bit more bold and a little bit more confident with the movement. Yeah, that's so I, I usually teach people how to fail first. Yeah, those GMB guys that I follow and I get the emails from they have a, um, they sent an email out on their email campaigns a couple of weeks ago about falling safely. And they send that out mm -hmm. on a regular basis, like every six months, I get that post and Maybe that's something I should share with the group as well about falling in this context. I feel like this could actually be like a mini course now that we're talking about it, like a, like an intensive on how to, you know, why you backwards train and, and how you should do it. And here's a program and here's some techniques, but uh, we, we can talk about putting something together later. Um, well, now I can't. Well, I think that. this is a good point. I just wanted, this occurred to me and I think it's important enough that uh, one of the, th the elderly, mm -hmm. one of the, the most traumatic and most life changing events that they may have that may happen is falling backward. Yeah. And it, it's interesting because it's the strength of their quads to if if you're watching this right now and you, you and you can't stand up and just move your foot as though you're going to take a step back, but don't. And that position of the foot there is what would enable you to stop yourself falling. Right. And when certain, when, when the, because muscle muscles and the musculature deteriorates as we age, but we can fight it through exercise. Mm -hmm. And some people, they get so weak that if they start to lose their balance and they put that foot back to stop themselves, they don't stop themselves because they don't have the strength to do it. Right. So that's a really good reason to, if you know anybody who is getting older, mm -hmm. hey, let's go outside and, and find some place. And you can even use some kind of railing if it's, you know, a brick wall or something that they're walking beside and, and they can support themselves, but getting themselves strong enough to regularly walk backward, which may save them 
coming up if they ever do lose their balance and they're right. falling backward because if they can't stop themselves, it's like a tree falling in the, you know, the yep. back of the head. Absolutely. It's all bad, bad news. Yeah. Wrists, hips, right. And you know, yeah. it's, it's one of the, the leading causes for hospitalizations and, yeah. and, um, fatal outcomes for elderly people is, is the broken, broken hips and the surgeries that are needed to put all that together. So there you go. Uh, coach is just giving the, her input here that, um, she'd say to train on the surface that you're, um, that you train on the surface that you're training to be on. So like, you know, going to a hockey pitch and if you're going to be mm-hmm. umpiring on artificial turf, there's absolutely good merit to that. Um, I, yeah. I agree at the end of the day, I think I'm the kind of person who gets really caught up on doing things right. And if I don't have the right surface and I'm like, well, I can't do it. So don't get caught mm-hmm. in that trap and just go out to that grass field as long as it's not pitted. Like, remember when I was running backwards and I, in the middle of the, the, the soccer field, Corey, yeah. and I was like, don't run in the center of that. Cause you're going to get in the pit. Like I did. And it was just freaky. I'm, I'm running backwards and there's just like in the center of the pitch, there was like a, a big pit, a, a divot. And I stepped into it and I was like, ah, anyway, because I'm definitely not overreacting to anything there. Um, let's see, Neil's saying probably a running track. It's soft, but you have a good grip on it. Yeah. If, if that's available to you, awesome. There you go. Um, the college of the field hockey umpire. There you go. Do you get a degree? Obviously huh. with <laughs> Scott with honors from the university of FH umpires. I do. I, I did. When I first started FH umpires, I had a little section on the website. I called FH university, <laughs> but I gave that up cause it was too hard. But there you go, Bachelor of Umpiring. Do you know that there is a college in England, St. Mary's, of something of something, that I've been attending a few free webinars that Stuart Carrington, who wrote uh, a book that I have referred to in some of the podcasts, um, he, he wrote a really excellent book on football refereeing let me see if I can find it really quick. Or Andy, Andy, Google, Google Stuart Carrington's book. It's it's about football refereeing, but he did a, this whole data-based analysis of refereeing decisions and all that kind of stuff, something I'd never seen the likes of before. Anyway, he leads up this Masters in Sports Officiating. So I've been, I've been looking at it and thinking, oh my God, that would be so cool to take, but it's literally like so many moose dollars. I can't even. So, um, Mm. if anybody wants to give me a scholarship to St. Mary's so I can take this course, that would be awesome. Andrea says, great. Thanks very much. A major in backward running. (laughs) Neil's umpire Andy has passed the course of backwards running successfully. Exactly. I loved it. (laughs) Rachel's already passed the session by falling over in front of five teams. Oh my God. Andy, I'm going to edit, going to make a vid and edit an ecam for me. Yes, you are. Yes. St. Mary's in Twickenham. That's, that's the college that's doing it. So there you go. Um, that's definitely a possibility. I was going to tell a story about falling over backwards, but maybe I'll save it for the next time. Cause we are already at 10 to two. Holy smokes. Corey, remember when you said that this was going to be 20 minutes? Do you yeah. remember that? And yeah. I said, nope. <laughs> oh, and I, I even th- keep thinking, oh, I should mention this and I should mention that, but I'm yes. just, no, nope. that's good. Let's leave it for now. But tell you what, everybody, if you have more questions and if you're watching on the replay, feel free, just like hashtag replay, ask your question. Corey and I will keep coming back to the video and we will answer any questions that you have. So please don't hesitate and do not be shy because I certainly am not. Um, here's a, he's, here's a URL. That's, I guess that's to Stuart Carrington's book. We will see Scott saying I injured a coach by running backwards into him once. Oh my God. Who hasn't done that? Cat's off to work. She says, thanks very much. Corey, can you read this? I can. What does it say? It says, thanks a lot and goodbye, Keely. Oh, Many thanks. Excellent session. And my, yeah. Well, thanks for reading the English out for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Corey, you're so funny. So good. Um, 
Let's see. What have I missed? Anything else? And it's <laughs> Scott saying that running into the coach was better than getting him injured. So there you go. You're all too long over chat. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much to everybody who tuned in. I look forward to hearing your feedback on this. Anything else that you want to know, if you think this would be a valuable sort of, I don't know, mini course or something to follow up in, especially in FHE3T yellow or anything like that, you know, let me know because I'm, you know, it's new to me, but I'm very excited about it. And if it's something that can make you better, I am all over that. I am all about making you better. So please have a look. Uh, don't forget, uh, I'm just going to switch to this, Corey. Don't worry, you're still on the broadcast. That I want to show. Uh, I need to get to the graphic. Here it is. Don't forget, as always, FHU 3T yellow green for $3 a month. We'd really appreciate it because it would help me be able to support um continue giving the free education out. The yellow is a great option. If you're ready to take the next step, if you're returning to hockey and you're ready to go, or if you want to put a group together, call yourself anything you want to, and you will be a group and you can get a red membership and, uh, diffuse the costs amongst you. So give that a shot. Contact me for more information. DM me as always. Um, Zed says, great stuff. Thank you. Rachel says, great stuff. Dennis says, thank you. Scott says, thanks very much. I'm really glad you found it interesting, everybody. And Corey, thanks for joining me. I hope you had fun. Was, was that a good time? It was good. Yeah. Awesome. I was nervous to start, but then I got comfortable. <laughs> Just like me, Adam, thanks very much for another useful session. Excellent. Everybody have a fantastic rest of your Wednesday, or if you're Gopi, it's Thursday already because it's going to be midnight or 1230 where he is in India. And I had a great time and we will see you next week. Go check out the YouTube shorts because they're really fun. Thanks everybody. Bye.